Hey, this is Jay Young with King Operating. Have you ever considered paying less money in taxes? Would you like to do what the wealthy do and invest in oil and gas? Go on our website, kingoperating.com, and get my book about our model, ADD, Acquire, Develop, and Divest. Or call our number, 214-420-3000, to talk to somebody today about investing in oil and gas and saving money on your taxes. The Jay Young Show is a weekly podcast featuring insightful discussions with anyone from big business CEOs, celebrities, to military heroes. Each interview is a personal conversation about business, life, and anything in between. And now, your host, Jay Young. Hey everybody, I have had the pleasure on part one of talking with my great friend, Bob Bodine, about you know business and about the power of who and who you are. And during that first episode, we went over a lot of stories, some great Texas Ranger stories. We went over the power of who and what does the power of who mean? And why should you read his book, get the workbook and go, go through this? Because, you know, I admire a lot about Bob and his love for his wife and his kids and his business. And, 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 you know, taking that thing to say, Hey, you know what? My dad was a, his dad was a recruiter and, and, Bob went to him one time and said, man, you know what? I love sports. How can I? And he played golf at SMU from Chicago, came down and said, you know what? I love sports. I want to get involved. I know I can make a living. I can make money recruiting uh, with sports. And so he got involved in that. Bob, thank you for being on the show for the second, the second time in as many minutes. We just finished up the first. <laughs> Thanks for being on again. It's always energizing. It, you know, time just goes so fast when you're with people you love. And it just is easy conversation. And there's so many things that we can share, Jay, between the two of us to help people today. People need some inspiration, some encouragement, because they're looking at this. They're uncertain. They're worried about what's going to happen next. They don't know what necessarily if they got jobs, they got this, um, how it's going to work out. Listen. Uh, it, it, we're going to try to inspire them today. Absolutely. I mean, during unprecedented times, uncertainty, and people are fear. I mean, we, we're going to talk about. We already talked about in the first show the power of who. Let's talk about. Let's talk about two chairs because that's a whole. That's a whole same in itself. I mean, man, what a great, what a great book you wrote, and and the 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 well, behind it, but also create church because you and. Uh, you know, the Binkley family who lives in my neighborhood, I'm good friends with, with Dr. John and also Ryan. Tell us a little bit about Create Church because I want people to, to if, they're, if they're anywhere close to George Bush and Central, I believe there's a building that you guys did there, right? Brand Something new. About, right? And, and so uh, I know that you're there a lot. I know that, that um, Ryan Binkley is, is the uh, pastor there. Tell us a little bit about that journey with, with Create Church. So, uh, so, you know, I, I have some great friends of mine who are top pastors all over and, and, and some of them guys like Jack Graham and all these other people want me to go out and, and help new churches do things and grow and, and, and kind of expand, you know, people who are top pastors, they're trying to grow things and take it in other directions and open it up. And so when I had a chance to meet Ryan Binkley, who could be uh, him and Ellie could be two of the finest people you get a chance to meet. I mean, Ryan's a, a it's very unique because he's a, you know, University of Texas, SMU MBA, um, you know, all of a sudden got a call to kind of go into to the whole aspect of, of being a pastor. He lived in Atlanta, kind of grew up in, with a church and, a, and probably one of the most diverse churches in history uh, in Atlanta. And, um, and then his his, his dad, who had run a company uh, at, with his brother, and his brother gets uh, hit by a, a drunk driver uh, and dies on, on his bike. And so Ryan has to stop what he's doing in Atlanta and come back and help run the company. His dad's in like shock and, and this, and Ryan steps in. God wants him to go do it, and he takes a company, and of course, your first year, you're down like 40%. The next year, you're down 30 And then all of a sudden, the blessing comes because Ryan's just a winner. I mean, he's just unbelievable. He's ridiculously good looking, so it's really unfair right off the bat there. And so I'm really, I really, already, I already just like him a little bit for that. And so, and so he, uh, he, you know, he has this 
fantastic ability to love people. And, and so he built, then the company grew 350% the next year. And so wow. he started, he wanted immediately back, started up create church, you know, right there in a, in a little spot, right in Richardson. Uh, and, and in five, six years, uh, he's now built something that's got a phenomenal new building uh, and like right, at, right there on 121 and central. And it's, uh, it's, uh, you can see the building, it's on 31 acres. They just built a spot and God has just blessed us. And it's again, in Dallas, it's one of the most diverse churches that you could possibly go to. And it's, and it's, uh, you know, it's non-denominational, not, you know, non-denominational. It, it's got great music. It's got great inspiration and it's a community. It touches people. It's right. just, and his, he, he, you know, he, he's married, you know, has fans, six kids and, you know, he's just, I mean, he's, he's just, it's just, you know, just unbelievable to see him and his wife. And so people ought to look, if you're looking for a spot where people know your name and talk to you and hug you and, and care about you and are inspiring you and challenging you to, to have a better relationship and a, and a stronger walk uh, and a better marriage, then I, I got to tell you, I just love him. I just love him. My wife loves him. Uh, you know, my kids, you know, my grandkids, everybody. Yeah, he is a great guy. And I know you came from uh, Prestonwood. I had Jack Graham on the show a couple, couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And, and Jack's a great guy. And the Zig Ziglar. And to leave that, to leave all that and go with Ryan, I know that, that uh, well, I mean, Jack has it, some. Jack will push his, you know, in this process because he loves that. I've talked to all of Jack. Jack's one of my really close friends. And, uh, you know, he's, I'm a, I'm a member of his church. It's really funny as you never leave your membership of Prestonwood. And I always go back and do things with him. He's just a fantastic guy. And at the same time, you know, Ryan, you know, I'm on his board. I love, I love, I love everything. And so this is a great, you know, I'm trying, I normally go out and do talks for everybody, but at the same time, this is a, this is like my mission and everything is to kind of help them do kind of grow. And, and again, Ryan's just one of our kind of who guys that you love doing life with. And so he makes me a better person just being with him. Really is. That's awesome. So how long ago did you write the book, Two Chairs? So it took me 40 years to write Two Chairs. 40? <laughs> 40. Wow. And so, is that crazy? And yeah, so back to your mother. I, I know there's stories about your mother in there. But, yeah, but. And I'll take you back a little bit, but um, you know, it took, so when I wrote uh, I had a I had a friend of mine and he had he was looking he's really in trouble with one of his buddies who was considering to kind of get uh, you know the market had dropped problems with this he was thinking suicide this other guy his friend and he said what am I going to say to this guy and I said to him I said well there's seven things I think you should do in times of crisis and and so I start to list those and he goes. So like, hold a second, did you just like roll out seven things? And I go, yeah, well, <laughs> and so he goes, we need, and, and it, all seven things lead to the, to the name of my book, Two Chairs, right? And so he looked and he said to me, and, and we, we stopped the problem with this guy and he calls me back and says, okay, we're doing this book. And I said, I'm really busy. One of my buddies, George Brandon, I said, I'm really busy. I can't do this. And he goes, busy like forget it and so I go to my wife and I said George is like saying hey it's time for me to write this book I've been da, 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 I've been doing two chairs for 40 years and so he said uh, no you you and she goes no no you have to write it and so I go and get up and, and, and do two chairs with God so you know the, the, and, and I'll tell you about that concept in a second, but I'm talking to God at two chairs and he said oh no we got to do this I said it took me four and a half years to write the power of who <laughs> But I don't, what are you, this is insane. He goes, I didn't ask you to talk to all those people when you were doing it. <laughs> and he says, tell you took what two chairs is in the very beginning. Yeah. What? So, so when I first, let me just kind of give a, a, a flavor. So when I was young, I went to my, you know, my dad was my, you know, I wrote the power of who through the lens of my dad. I wrote this book through the lens of my mom. And, uh, and so my mom was kind of my spiritual guru, you know? And so I would, uh, you know, cause I, I, I grew up in at least, you know, in, in, in the strong, in the Catholic, you know, faith and, 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 and grew up in a way which I, I could have, you know, as long as we're done with church in 20 minutes um, and I could watch the Chicago Bears, that would be good. <laughs> and then, 
you know, so like reading the word or doing something like that, you know, I, you know, we pay Father Mulcahy to do that. And, uh, <laughs> and so, but this was just a little deeper. And so my mom, when I talked to her, I said, hey, so what do you do in times of trouble? What do you do finding your mate? How would I get my goals and how my dreams? My mom goes, oh, those are really good questions. And my mom was like, she was, she's unbelievable. I, I, I think I was gifted my mom and my dad just so I could share stories in the future with other people, right? And let wow. them love on them. I would really do. And so my mom said to me, she goes, listen, I don't have the answers to that, but I know who does. And so I'm going to ask you, Bob, three questions, okay? And these three questions are really simple, but they're disruptive. And these questions will point you in the right direction. And, and so it's, uh, you know, it's funny is that for some reason, when problems arise, Jay, we, we have a tendency not to ask good questions. You know? <laughs> and for sure, the last one we want to ask is, does God know? And so, <laughs> you know, because we just think, hey, he's, he's busy, he's removed, he's not, he's only work us ISIS, heart attacks, natural disasters, you know, he's got a lot of other things that he's doing that he couldn't talk to me. And I haven't really probably grown up with the facet that actually we do it, even though we have this total conversation going all the time in our ear from negative that's telling us all the negative things. But if I ever said I, I was talking to God, that would be like schizophrenia. I mean, we we'd be crazy. And then how could I write, I'm an executive recruiter and write a book about this. Cause I had a number of my friends, you know, who were senior executives said, Oh no, that's probably not a good idea. And so I looked and go, yeah, well, it's the only reason for my success. <laughs> I've been, I've wow. been having the same meeting for 40 years for mentoring advice and daily guidance. And I don't know how to express to other people, you know, what an opportunity that it is. So my mom starts and she says to me, so these four questions, I'm going to ask you the question. And I do this question with a large number of people and they come into my office and I say to them, listen, what I see is that you're kind of at this point. And so I'm going to ask you three questions that I said, my mom asked me, so you can't get mad at me. You'd have to get mad at my mom. And that of course diffuses all this issue, right? And so, so the first question is, does God know your situation? That's really interesting. You know, a lot of people all say yes. And so I said, uh, yeah, no, the highest priority in a time of crisis like we're in right now is to get your mind above the crisis. That's what all good, successful CEOs, top leaders can do. They're in it. Every major sports athlete, Tom Brady, okay, Nick Saban, they know when the trouble that to be calm and to get your mind above it. And so how would I, I got to get above it so I can see the situation just as it is. And the highest thought, of course, is God. And so I, my mom says, do you think he knows about the fact that you got goals, dreams, uh, you're looking for a mate and you got and, and trouble? I said, no, he knows. And she says, not only does he know, but he wants you to know he knows. See, people don't understand who are listening to this today. God knows exactly where you are in your apartment. I mean, he's got your telephone line. You know, he knows your cell number. This is not confusing to him. And, and so the fact that he knows your situation is simple and yet disruptive in the fact that, like, when times of trouble, you said, seriously, God, do you know about this? No, he knows. Which, gonna get us, which is going to get us to question number two, which is, is this too hard for him to handle your trouble? And so uh, I said, no. And she goes, yeah, but it's too hard for you. See, it, we all come to a point in our life where we realize there is a limit to what Bob and Jay can do. And if who you are is what you have and what you have is taken from you, then who are you? Mm. And so, you know, if, what if, we can control more of what we can't see than what we can. And if we understood this, it would not only make a better day, it would make a better life. You don't get to control pandemics. We don't get to control opening day pitch. We don't get to control our wives. <laughs> we get to control ourselves. Right. We say our energy, our love, and our time, and how we react. There's something unbelievable about the opportunity we have, and we're not taking it. We get to question number three, and my mom says, do you, do you think that God, Bob, has a good, a good plan for you? And I said, I do. And she goes, what is it? I don't know, Mom. And she, go, <laughs> and she goes, exactly. She says, do you own chairs, Bob? 
And I go, yes. She goes, so you could have like one chair for you and one for God at your house and you could meet him in the morning and you would get to talk to him and you get to talk one minute and he gets to talk four. And if you want to talk to, he gets eight. So our concept today, when we talk to God is that normally we just tell him and bladder off all our troubles. And then we never think about it or we're sitting reading a devotional, like we're vicariously living through someone else having a good conversation with God. Or we're like reading his autobiography while we're talking to him. I'm reading Jay's autobiography and I'm talking to Jay. I don't know. That would, I think there's a time for me to read your autobiography. I just want to actually, when I talk to you, talk because I would get a lot out of it in this process. So like if I had Warren Buffett come to my house for five minutes, would I set up two chairs? Yes. And would I make him come over to me in my jammies while I'm in my bed? No, I'd have two chairs. I'd be ready. I'd have the coffee ready for him. I would get him in. And would I talk the whole time when, when he's going to talk? No, no. I'd rather hear him talk than me. He's a lot smarter than me. And so we're missing this. So my mom says, if there's a 1% chance, 1% chance that the guy who created the whole world would meet you. You know, I have people who are seekers, who don't believe in God, who are listening and saying, come on, seriously. And I, and, and I say to them, if there's a 1% chance that God would meet you tomorrow, would you go? And they, everybody says yes. And I said, well, where have you been? So now we can just shift to the conversation because once someone reads this book, we're talking about someone who knows everything about this, has written a plan on your heart. And so when people like tell me that their hearts desire something and then they have one little mistake and like all of a sudden I'm never going to get my plan. This was never going to go good. I was just about to go to prom I, and now I don't get to go to prom. I just was about to get to go. I had a kid the other day and he was going about to be, you know, he was a quarterback and he didn't get picked for the NFL draft. And I said to him, so is it your heart's desire to be an NFL quarterback? Yeah. And he says, absolutely, Mr. Brody. And I go, well, I said, so the cop out sometimes in Christianity is we say it's not God's will. I said, but I could have 2000 people that I know and none of them think they can be NFL quarterbacks. And so my question is, so are you going to quit? So you're going to just stop? You're not going to keep going? You're not going to do the things you do? Reach out, reconnect, trust God, have faith. And he goes, well, I don't mean, you know, Mr. Wayne, I don't have like your faith. And I said, so listen, I said, so like, have you ever been in a cab in New York? You have faith. <laughs> I mean, you've ever checked a plane and checked the lug nuts? No, no. Faith is, God dealt everybody a measure of faith, right? And so what it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for. All we got to have is hope. And we have to have hope in the right person. And so I, I, I tell people, look, at you. why don't you try something? If you want something that you've never had, you're going to have to do some things you've never done. And so, and if you don't have a plan for your life, I don't know about it. Somebody has one for you. And I'd rather talk about to the guy who's made the plan on my heart and ask him. And so what's so crazy, Jay, is that, so what's so crazy about this thing is this. Uh, I have people, since I wrote the book, all over the world, I don't know who these people are, sending me pictures of their two chairs telling me of the greatest things that's ever happened to them ever in their whole life. And so well, how do you explain the inexplainable? Well, what's, people say to me, well, what's God going to say to me at two chairs, Bob? I didn't write three chairs. I don't get to go. You're going to have to do this on your own. And the answer is, but I can promise you that if people are here and would take a chance, you know, the most comforting thing that you can do is, and, is that God knows. And it feels so secure. And, and so if you want a piece in the pandemic about what your future is, what's happening, I don't know. Ask him. You're going to be shocked. You're going to have to buckle up when he talks to you. Wow. Wow. I mean, you've done some, some speeches in front of some big groups before. And then I, I, I think one of the most emotional times that I've had just sharing you sharing your stories with me was something about you going down in, in a prison and talking about some of the stories there. Could you share just a yeah. So I have, I had a friend of mine uh, who I helped, who had been in prison and then had a 60 year sentence, but it got, because he didn't have anybody in the house when he was stealing, he got it cut to 30 and then his mom prayed for him every single day. And he got out of that. It was just meth. You know, it was just, it, sometimes people get caught up in some drugs and they can't do anything. And so he got out and then he'd been doing some really good stuff. And the guy's fantastic Christian guy, young guy trying to turn his life around. And so he wanted to talk and I helped him. 
and I got him with a football coach, uh, David Bailiff at Rice at the time, and then he spoke at SMU, and then now he's doing books with John Gordon, and he's got a, a coffee bean. A. So we go out, and he says, you need to come talk with me at a prison, a, a maximum security prison. This is the toughest prison in Texas. It's called the Michael Unit. And I said, so I'm thinking, hmm, okay. And so he, uh, and so he, he, he said, I sent the book to the to the warden and the warden's wife loves it. And they have never let anybody talk to more than 20 people because it's not safe. But the warden wants you to talk to 1500, you know, like four or 500 at a time. And, and then, you know, each of them are going to get one of your little books. He says, we're going to give them a paperback that, that I had a foundation bought, made up paperbacks so that prisons, military, first responders, social services would have this book. And it's just crazy. So I, you walk into this prison. So as what, I'm, what was your first thought? What what did you think that was going to happen before you got there? And oh, okay, so I'm first off, I'm thinking as I'm driving down. So I I he's asked me to do this, and I immediately get to two chairs the next day, and I go, "What would I talk about? I didn't go to prison. I don't. I I, I this would be terrible. I mean, I've spoken at like a juvenile detention center down off a of thirty one time, and that was like you know wild. But here it's different. They're in for life, and Bad things happen here. I mean, it's you're you're in a fight for your life the first time you're there, and so uh, two day and and the night before I came there, two people committed suicide. You know, so it's just not like things are happening. This is like terrible, and so I uh, thought, what would I say? And so I said to God, and, you know, so what do you want me to talk about? And He said, when they close the door behind you, and you can hear the air go, I'll download the the talk. And I, and, and honestly, this is what I said. <laughs> I'm really not comfortable with that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm a control freak. I said, I'd like to have things planned. And he goes, I know that. This is way above your pay grade. He said, you would have no idea what to say. And so I said, yes. Yeah. So I, I did pick one of my, my best friends, you know, George Brandon to come with me because he's six, four, kind of like you. So I feel like I have somebody safe with me to help, you know, if I'm all of a sudden in trouble. And so we get there, I start to come in and up front and you get a feeling right off the bat. I, I, I gave a, I gave a talk to the guards and the, and the, and the administration first. And I felt it was a tougher environment to talk with them than it was when I'm about to speak to the, to the prisoners, you know, people in prison. When I walked in, I was first shocked when I looked at them. Um, you know who they look like? You and me. Wow. I mean, so these are people who are just there and they're stuck and they, and they haven't got it. And so they're all holding my book. I'm thinking, seriously, wow, this is crazy. And so, uh, so as, I, as I came in the prison, they took everything, your belt, your, and you don't have phones or anything. You have nothing. You have, and so I walk in and, and, I, and I can already see the message coming. And so I turn in and I get in front and I, and I come to the podium. This is, and... Uh, and, and they're all holding the book. And I said, and so I, I said, what if you could leave prison for five to 10 minutes every day? And, and the pain and the shame and the fear would leave you. And then all of a sudden, the power of God, the peace of God that passes all understanding would just rest on you. I said, that would be a good day, wouldn't it? And you could hear these guys, the first 150, 200, they go, huh, yeah, huh, yeah. And so, and I said, and then all of a sudden you can start to feel like, Hey, you're going to have to go back. And then, you know, you're starting to think, gosh, I, I used to know who I was and who, you know, and whose I was, I used to know the path I called, but I got to go back. And then I said, you hear God himself say this to you into your ear. You're not forgotten but loved. And, uh, and as I, and I could hear God say, hold for a second. As I did all 200, 300 of them stood to their feet and started to cheer and cry that they're not forgotten and loved. Now, I don't know. I didn't, I just about came, I just about came unglued. I didn't know what I said. Seriously. When I finished my talk, they got in line for a signing of the book. I, 
I looked over the warden. Are we doing a signing? I mean, do we get to do a signing? Because, I, and he looked at me and goes, yeah. I mean, so I, the first guy Jay said to me, did you come, did your mom told you that you were going to do a talk here one day? And I said, yeah. And so she goes, and he goes, I said, I'm here. And he goes, uh, he said, can I ask you a favor? And I said, sure. And he, and he goes, can I have a hug? Now we're at a maximum security prison and, and I'm thinking they're going to say no. And I looked at the warden and I don't know, he just kind of just shrugged his shoulders. And so this, I said, yeah, get over here. And so we did like 785 hugs. Now I'm telling you, these guys prayed for me. These guys were so, they wanted me to draw pictures of me hugging them. They wanted me to tell them that, hey, that God won't forget them. So I, I was, I've done talks all over and nothing has ever touched my life like what I do here. This was the greatest personal thing that I've ever done. And I got more out of it personally just to see why God said that if you would go and love on someone who's in prison, you're doing it for me and, I, I'll sh and there'll be a blessing. And I, I don't know, I was blessed immensely and I had no idea. I, I, I was just so naive to all of this, uh, what's going on in, in the world. And, and so, uh, you know, it, it's, it, was, it was really, a, it, was, it, was, it was a momentous time. It was just crazy. And so I would, I'd encourage, I, 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 I thank everybody like today, as I'm thinking about this pandemic of, of, of people who are like, in, who are like in prison today and in nursing homes and, and uh, you know, who are sitting in hospitals and we have all these great workers who have just, you know, gone out of their way, healthcare workers to help other people who are doing this. There's a blessing for every single one of them. Yeah. <laughs> every one of them is going to be blessed for taking the time to help someone and actually caring about people who were their families not allowed to get in and be the person and, and how heartbroken a family is that has lost anybody. And, but what a great day that that person's in heaven and, you know, and it's totally, you know, doing that at the same time. It's, it's just heartbreaking, but uh, it's really, it was really heartbreaking at this two chairs moment with these guys, because after I left the prison warden who kind of looked like, you know, Jackie Gleason in one of the old movies and such, or put his arm around me as we're walking out. He goes, you know, we did good today. And he said, I'm going to put up two chair areas around this prison so that when people go around, he says, they'll get a moment and they'll get a chance to talk to God. He says, wow. this will, he said, so how great is that? That's great. Yeah. That's great. I mean, people that, that they're, they feel like their life was over. Yeah. I mean, just, just laid it down right there. Right there. Just laid they it laid down. It. and They're it. all in. Yeah. They want, listen to me, they, no matter what, when you got nothing and you're at your worst, it would be unbelievable for you to know that you are not alone. And I'm telling you, the greatest thing about two chairs is that you could have a spot in your house. You don't have to go somewhere. I mean, I have kids that say to me, high school kids, college kids say to me, oh, Mr. Brody, and I don't go to church. And I said, do you own chairs? And, and so they go, yeah. And I go, well, I don't care if it's bean bags. I don't care if it's two rocks. Uh, but, but if you'll seek God first thing. He really digs the first thing. I didn't say that God's not going to do it. There's people who have had long time relationships with God, but I, I really believe that people who've had long time relationships need to reconnect and have him talk that actually you get to feel like you're known. So I, I can't say we're really like friends. If we're like doing a library deal, shh, no talking. And so, or I'm just like doing, and everything I'm saying doesn't seem like he gave me my personal quote. He gave me something to say, because I think sometimes we need to hear, I got you. You're going to be okay. I need you to go forward. I don't want you to do that. And so there's a confidence. When I talk about going out in your job and you have two chairs and you have the power of who, you now have some swag to go out into the market. And because now you're thinking it's not about you, it's about other people. And this is just unbelievable this is the so two chairs is the secret that changes everything for you the guy who created the world knows who you are has a plan and it's good and it's prosperous it has a future and it has a hope and all the things that you think that have gone wrong and you're not worthy and you didn't do this no, listen say you're sorry and move on you know let's go we haven't got time to waste because god is not the god of i was i will be he's a god of i am i'm right now and i got plans and i tell you 
we need some people to catch on to the fire. And you can, you're all alone in a nursing home. Your mom is, I, I bet they have two chairs. And now I'm going to be on fire. So I'm going to be like, hey, I'm getting out of here. Uh, things are going to be good. There's a future. And, and we need to hear that. And we need to hear this message. And if people don't like reading the book, they can get on and do two chairs audible. I did the power who and audible. So some people like just to listen to it. Other people, they want to read it. I mean, I had this great story. I had this great story of this girl in the, in my, even my power of who, who her dad had passed away and he'd given her the power who book. And she, she had heard him say at one of my talks at Bob, Bob, what is Bob like? the most that nobody knows about him. And you know what it is that I like, it's not the talk I like, it's talking to you after I like. I mean, Zig Ziglar lived in my neighborhood and he used to always, he'd wait and talk to every single person. I only care about that. That's the most important thing. And so she, she wanted to say to me, hey, my dad talked about this whole love thing and you, you know, doing text messages to each other, telling people you love them and da, da, da. And so she said, I got to tell you my who story. So after he passed away, he gave me your book that you wrote a thing to him. And I was looking everywhere in my house to find one note that said, Janice, I love you. And I can't find one written thing from a note from my dad. And, and I'm just telling you, if you're a dad and you hear that today, you got to write a letter, handwritten note to your kids saying you love them, that you're proud of them, and that you give them your, the blessing of the father. And so I said, it has a life changing. So anyway, she finally, after you passed away, says, okay, I, I'm just going to read the book because that's the last thing you gave me. And so she got like into page 56 or something and it says in there in my book that you're a treasure chest of gifts and talents. You do one thing better than anybody in the whole world. And I'm telling them about themselves and it's all in orange. And in the margin, it says, Janice, this is you. I love you, daddy. Wow. She finds her love letter three times in the book and she's got it. She rolls it up on Facebook and she goes, so two chairs, this is what God does. He has these little secret things to want to remind you that he, if you can't find a way, he, he's going to make a way. Right. He's got something that you didn't know. It's most of this is a setback, but it's a setup. It's a setup, something great. And every trouble is a, is an opportunity in disguise. Oh. And we just can't, it can't miss out on, on this. We have to know the heart of God. And that is, yes, there's tough things that have happened and he hasn't this, but God knows. And whatever it is, we're here for a short period of time. If my day's the last, you know, I'm, I, you know, and you'll be telling Cheryl in this, that we had this unbelievable time here today. And the answer is, and I'm okay with that. But, but at the same time, we can do so much. I mean, everything great that has happened, Jay, to you and me has happened in five minutes or less. I met Cheryl, you met Michelle, we have all these things, we get things, our kids are born, all of a sudden, boom. And then all of a sudden, our whole life changes. And then we get through life and we get busy again, and then we forget all the great things that ever happened. <laughs> we have this list of all these great things. So why? So we can re-stir up all the great things that have happened in our life so we can share those with our friends. And we can say, oh no, you're gonna be okay. I'll do it. Get over here. I'll lift you up, be with you. And then we can stick by people. And, and, and there's some people who just need us to be, to come up and kind of pick them up right now. And right. so, so that's where I, I really want them to kind of send a note saying, Hey, I'm thinking about you and I appreciate you. And I love you. Right. That's great. What a great deal. I mean, call your kids, tell them you love them. And, and I think I love the way you do it. I mean, you're not saying I love you, but you're saying to your kids, Hey, if I told you I loved you today, you know, making, yeah. But just making something of it so you just do it over and over again and they they know you obviously and they know your personality and they dig and it. You are, but I'll tell you what, that that's a great story. I love all those stories that you tell me about two chairs. I just can't I can't hear enough and I get I get emotional every time. And and I know that we had uh, I had Jack Graham on two weeks ago and then one week ago I had Doug Deason on and Doug oh. Deason, you know, Mr. Mr. D magazine. Yeah, had him and, and uh, his wife on, Mr. and Mrs. So Jackie Daly. So Jackie oh, Daly. She's fantastic. Yeah, I might have Doug back on because I wanted to know more about because Doug really talked about. Have you? I don't know if you've connected two chairs with Doug Deason and all the different work he's done with. With he wants to give um, prisoners a second chance. That's that is one of his major things. So I need to we need to connect you guys on a on a show or something because man, this this is just a great inspiration. 
Yeah, we had, I have one of the guys, buddy of mine, Chris Kleinert, who's, who knows him really well, who's, who's like President Hunt. He's one of the finest men I know. And he, uh, he gave two chairs to a woman who went to prison uh, and, 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 and she just had a, had, had a bad day. And the woman sent him a note back and he sent to me that said, uh, she knows why she's there now having read two chairs. So oh. she's, I've got 100 women that I'm going to bring to two chairs. That's my whole goal in life. And she says, I know my purpose. See, the opposite, you know what's so cool? The opposite of depression today is not happiness. It's purpose. You have to know why you were created, what it is. Each of us has an assignment and a purpose and a destiny all of our own. No one's like us. There's no competition that anybody has who's hearing this. You're amazing and you can do all these great things, but you can't do them if you don't know who you are, whose you are in the past. So wouldn't it be logical that God would meet us each day? And so why would I do it first? Is that what if he had something for you to do at 8.30 in the morning or nine and you missed your battle plan and you were going to do this great? I mean, I do it all the time. I sit with God. I go to my two chairs. So people ask me all the time, so what's this really like? And I say, I sit down with God. I say, good morning. And I said, ah, I'm a mess. Okay, so, and I got this going on, this and this and this and this. And then, you know, I kind of run out of energy on that. And I say, but I, I'm leaving that with you. And then I say, so what do you got for me today? What do you want me to do? And so it's not about achieving with God. It's about receiving. So even our work that we're about to do, he says to me, hey, I got somebody you're going to do at 10 o'clock. I, I, you're going to talk to. I, so who is it? You'll know. I just need you, to, I need you to go to work and start to inspire him and do this. And when we do, okay, when we seek him first and do the things that we were, you and I were created to do good works that he pre-planned before the foundation of the world, and all we have to do is just do the done, all these other things that we're looking for in our lives, he just gives us. It's like butter. And so, and so that's why I say to people all the time, listen, just give, you know, the, the, the dimension that you is really, I'm writing a new book beyond power of who the next point, and you know, it's called who dimensional, you know, how to live a transformational life in a transactional world is wow. that we're, we're just not one dimensional. You're, you're, you, you have so many dimensions and so many things that you can help people in so many different directions. And it's just, you're just such a blessing to people even having a show who, who thought this idea that you would do what you're doing here and that we would be sitting here. It's just why we have no idea who's going to listen to this and who we're going to bless. But if you and I together, which we agree that we are doing it, one a person going to do it, that's enough for me. Right. It's only had to be one. Now, it's going to be much more than one. But even if it was one, it would be fantastic. Right. Wow. That's great. That's great news. Hey, so um, we talked about the power of who. Yeah. We talked about the creatures. We talked about two chairs. And, and we've got a lot of time here, and I don't want this to go too long. So sure. I want to kind of start wrapping this thing up. And I noticed that you've got a lot of uh, memorabilia on your, on your wall there behind you. And uh, <laughs> so what, what is one of your favorite, favorite uh, pictures up there? I have a picture, and it's over your right shoulder right there. If people can see your Nolan right there, <laughs> I'm going to move as people watch me. I'm going to <laughs> And you can see me, and here's mine. Oh my and, gosh! And Nolan, Nolan, Nolan signed that to me. No, you know, don't mess with Texas. You know. <laughs> well, it's a different, it's a different angle. It's a different yeah, picture from a different, different angle. angle. Oh yeah, it's wow. just crazy. So That's it's awesome. so it's so fun to have done like Texas Rangers and to be around iconic people who have done things that no one possibly conceived can actually be done. I mean, the whole Nolan, you know, the whole Ryan family, I love every single one of them, you know, Reed Ryan, Reese, the whole thing, his, his mom. I mean, they're just, uh, they're just amazing people. And, uh, you know, Nolan's great stories just always of Nolan, you know, you know, sitting next to, as you and I would sit every once in the next to Jim Sundberg, you know, as he'd just sit there and he'd be telling us, or we're sitting next to Pudge, you know, Rodriguez at a deal. And people are kind of going, seriously, yeah, no, we just got to do that. I mean, what's it's like a gift of God, you know, who would ever have to even consider that you do that? Oh and then God. we're watching pictures and then I'd say, Hey, do you ever go up against like Nolan Ryan? And Jim would look and go, he hit me right in this little spot in my back on purpose, you know? <laughs> oh my gosh. That's and he awesome. Said, 
And I told him, I said, you know, when all of a sudden, you know, like we worked together, I said, seriously, why do you do that? He goes, I don't know. You were giving me this look. You were crowding the plate a little bit. He says, he says, you remember it? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. Yeah, I had to ping you. <laughs> wow. I mean, one of my, I, I was, I met Pete Rose. Uh, I met Pete Rose. And I was talking to Pete Rose and I, and I said, yeah, I said, me, I had an affiliation with the Rangers, you know, at one time as a part of ownership of the group. And, and uh, he said, Nolan Ryan, he goes, he goes, he said exactly what the stats were against Nolan Ryan. Like, he's pitched against me 63 times. I hit him 12. I, or, or he had a great, you know, hitting percentage. I struck out. I mean, Pete Rose knew the stats. But when you have great pitchers like, like Nolan Ryan, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, we were there. Me and you were there. Uh, game six and seven, you know, St. Louis and, and uh, we sat next to Nolan game seven, you know, and, and just the all the air was out of our cells because of game six. We were so up and right there, very, very close to running on the field. I mean, there was all the owners there and it was just a – we could not wait. It was almost, I mean, epic, obviously, that, that, that we had the opportunity to this world – Almost world champions a couple of times before uh, you know things happen. But uh, what what are one of your favorite? Um, so I got a couple. Nolan stories or I got, I got a couple. So we hadn't been on this group, and we're gonna you know we got, you and I got to start out, and we got to be part of like this spring training. All of a sudden, we're gonna play a, you know the Houston you know Houston Astros, and we're gonna get to play them you know ownership group against the other ownership group, and and so in one of our things, we're just starting out, and and so I'm trying to you know I'm thinking I wouldn't like prepared like to get ready to all of a sudden take swings and like I'm I'm batting ready, and Nolan Ryan's gonna pitch for us, and then for our side for our team and throw, and they're throwing overhand pitch to us. And so I'm watching, you know, you know, you know, first off, you know, the clums all of a sudden up hitting and, and how they're doing and they're smacking the ball, you know, they're ripping the ball. And then I'm going to get up and Nolan up the very first time I'm up against him as we're taking a little like batting practice. He throws it right over my left shoulder. <laughs> I'm here. He throws it behind me and, <laughs> and then starts to smirk. And I thought. I don't want to see the hundred mile an hour. And I guarantee you, I bet he could still do that. And oh, so I just thought it was crazy. So I'm now going to do it. And he throws one pitch and I just smack it. Like it was like off the end of the bat. It was kind of a crappy little hit. And I thought, Oh gee, I'm then I got to do something really good this time. And, da, da, da. and so he throws the next one. As I do, I turn hard and bam, hip pointer. <laughs> and I don't know if you remember that. I was a disaster. Oh. I'm just new. Everything's this. I'm all of a sudden, you know, I just know I was being all of a sudden I'm cocky and I, and I, and I'm clearly heading to two chairs to say, did you know about this guy? <laughs> <laughs> so it was, but it was very humbling and this, and everyone always remember Nolan would always like bring that up. Oh, that was a really good hit right off the bat. Uh, and so I, it, I'd always laugh in that. And so. Now, one of, against her, I, I batted against Jim Sunberg one time. Really? Jim there and just threw balls and threw balls and, and I and I was I was swinging the bat and I would swing the bat and I'd go, is there a hole in the bat? Because it, it it's I haven't tried to hit a baseball in years and we were all geared up for these games that we had, you know, against everybody. And and, and so I went to D bat and I started practicing and I mean, because it is. I mean, you're like, okay, Jim Sunberg, he's going he's not gonna throw it sixty miles an hour, fifty six, whatever. And and he would throw it right over the plate. I had my bat, I swing and I I. Couldn't hit it. I mean, then I, I hit a couple. I broke two bats. I broke Ken Hurst's. Ken Hurst, you know, all, all the money Ken Hurst has, and he brings up these wooden bats. I break two of them. I mean, I don't know how to hit anymore, and it's just a crazy deal. But, man, I tell you, you're right. When when, when uh, you haven't done anything in so long, and all of a sudden, here it you go. It stings your hands to start. You know, the, I forgot the old stingers and the fingers and the hand and all that. Oh, yeah. Oh, but yeah. the next Absolutely. year – but the second year, you and I, we worked out like crazy to get prepared. And then we were ripping the ball then. And I was yeah. trying to – it took me a while, but I, I wasn't going to be prepared. I worked out for six months just to get for one day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's my favorite story, one of my favorite stories. So – and it's not one that you'd kind of know. And so I love Jeff Bannister. And he was just uh, – he was just a guy. I mean, 
And, and he, you know, he's like, he's like John Wayne. I mean, he carried himself, loved his wife, loved his family. Um, and so we became friends in this process. And, 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 and I would always, no matter what, if I came in to the baseball field, da, 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 my first thing is I'm going to go over and I'm saluting like him over in the, where he's standing, you know, because I just really dig it. So one day, a buddy of mine, Tommy McClellan, who's the athletic director at, at uh, Louisiana Tech, he asked me and he said, listen, our baseball team's doing our big final thing. We, we, you know, the guy who owns our things, big with origin bank, kind of the lead guy, we'd like to fly him out. Could you get him to fly out and do a talk to our baseball team? And so I said, to, you know, I get, I get him and, and they have a, a plane. We go out and it's just going to be a, you know, one thing, go in, do the thing, do the thing, etc. And he loves his stuff. He's just really good. We walk into this room with Jeff and it, Jeff's such a stud. I mean, he's kind of, he's kind of, kind of got Arnold Palmer's, you know, kind of charisma skills you know, how he walks, how he does it. He hitches his pants. He does all this stuff. And he comes up and we're like in this little room that has all the seats and he's got a little stage and da, da, da. And he's talking to these, you know, 60 baseball guys who all are dressed in like Louisiana tech, great colors, ties, perfect. And these kids are like enamored because we're like world series, you know, two years in a row. And, and so it's like this. And, and so he starts off and he kind of says, hey, so let me ask a question to you guys. He's asked the team, he says, um, why do you play the game? And so one of these really good looking guys stands up and he says, play it for the love of the game. And all the other players, they're all like going, ooh, you know, like, hey, good, good answer, you know, you know, you know, court, you know, it, whatever his name was. And so, and so he looked and he goes, yeah, hey. He says, well, he says, I got some news for you, though, guys. Uh, the game doesn't love you back. You know, the person on your right and your left does. Your mom, your dad, these are the people who love you back. So he says, this game's tough. I've had my neck broken. I, I never was going to get a shot at something. He says, I have in my wallet a, a couple dreams that I have that I keep, that I keep pulling out when I'm just down in my, in my count and I'm forgetting that I'm going to do this and I can do it. And I'll never forget that day. So, you know, the, the issue is, is that people matter most. Our heart knows it. God taught us. And yet we've forgotten. And in this pandemic, we cannot forget that people matter most, that it's community, it's our church, it's our family, it's our friends, it's, our, it's people that we know who are struggling a little bit that we need to reach out and touch them. Bannister, holy cow, Jeff, he totally gets this. And he wants, he sees every opportunity as a moment, right? I get this moment and I'm planting something in their heart because in this world, you're going to have trouble. How much trouble? Buttloads. But God said, and this is my, people ask me, what's my quote? It's, it's John 16, 33. It's, you're going to have trouble. But God said the very next thing, be of good cheer. Now, that's the most ridiculous thing you could possibly say when you're in trouble. I mean, who in their right mind likes trouble? Why would you have that as your quote? Because we're talking about God. So he can't like think trouble is the same way we think trouble. It must be a setup because every one of us, no matter who's in trouble, who's mad at God, who really is mad at God right now, something like this didn't have some time where trouble turned into something great. So who says it's not going to turn into something great? Have you had a bunch of trouble that's turned out great? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And so we're just at a spot where sometimes in, 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 you never expected, I didn't expect, I have so many other stories that people would just laugh at, but I never expected Bannister to like come in and then immediately shift. And so it's kind of, it's kind of like Arnold Palmer stories that I tell, right? Where all of a sudden you're the king of, of, of sports is flipping it on everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's why I always try to, I always, try to remind people that, you know, you get moments, but as you get older, as I found every year that I get older, uh, I find that, you know, that I, I want to take a, advantage of a moment to get people to not say, hey, listen, the fat lady hasn't sung yet. She ain't, she ain't singing here. The answer is, you're going to come through this, but it's, it's just, I need you to fight. I need you to, you, you got to start. One thing leads to another. How? 
I don't know, but you got to do your one thing first for it to lead to another. And, and so if the first thing is, if it, it, and since it's not about you, let's just start by helping your, your, your wife. You know, let's just start by being kind to somebody. You know, I have everybody in our neighborhood. I don't know about you, but all our neighbors are like outside on their chairs. Mm. I didn't even know any of my neighbors. Here it is. I'm the power who I don't even know any of my neighbors. And that's so it's like and, and now we're up, down, talking, you know, we're social distancing, but we're but we're talking, stopping you know, sitting across, then they say, hey, come over, sit in the chair six feet across, and da 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 and then, hey, we sit and talk about it, and we start to get to each other. Now, our whole, our whole group is a whole lot closer. And I, what would have ever seen that as a possibility, right? Right, it's, right. It's, wow. it's, always, it's, a, it's always, again, everything's, everything in life is a story, you know? You know, that's, if, and people always do it, and that's, you know, I'm always trying to remind, you know, that, you, the guy who's the owner of, used to be head of Sony and, and was the head of, of, and now the head of the Golden State Warriors wrote a book called Tell It to Win. And it's always great because every, everybody, when you talk about interviewing as you go out, tell little stories about yourself. Tell something about your wife. Tell something about your kids. But for sure, don't go into an interview and not be you. Otherwise, I can't get that, ju- I can't get that juice. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, we're, we're getting ready to wrap it up. But I want to ask you a couple of so anything that you would tell your 20 year old self or if you're at a Starbucks, I mean, I can't imagine the people. That's what I most admire about you. Cause it doesn't matter who you're talking to. You're going to tell your heart, you yeah. know, and what, and, and you told me that so, so many different times. And, and what, what, if, when you're going to Starbucks, whenever we can do the social distancing or walk into a Starbucks and, and there's somebody there and you see they're down, and you see they're down and they're, they're just kind of hanging out there. What does Bob Odin tell them? You know, I love, I, I, I like to. I know I you're can, not going to pass them up. No, <laughs> no I, matter, I'm not. No matter I'm if, not it's, gonna, if you're on fire, you're not going to pass them up. I know Bob Odin's going to say something. Well, I, what is, I love it. First off, I, you know, a lot of times I'm going to look at that person and say, hey, how's it going? I'm talking to him. I say, hey, you know, you know and I, I'm going to try to build some familiarity of something why, why we're here, right? And that why we're in this spot. And then I say, hey, so. So I, then I'm going to start and say, hey, I have this, I, you know, I, I wrote this book or I have this interesting story. And I, I said, are you a, like a friend? Are you like somebody who likes? I, I said, and, and I'm going to get him slowly because I don't believe we were meeting by chance. I believe that, hey, he's probably somebody that God told me I want to see at four <laughs> at the coffee break here. And so I'm always expecting it. And so they kind of do it and expect, and they're going to give you some, they're going to give you some room. And so, so I'll, I'll bring up something. And one of the things that I like to do is, 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 is stop and say, Hey, so, so what's your dream? You know, what, what are you doing? I said, so one of the things I get it because I'm an executive recruiter is I get to hear people's dream. And most people won't tell you what it is. They won't like want to go out of their way. And so I, I, my dad used to get all his business, you know, get a ton of business with people who he sat next to on a plane. And, and so uh, my, the guys in our firm would always say, you're the luckiest guy. You sat next to this guy. He goes, what are you talking about? I talked to him. I said, hello. And so we'd always get to know, I tell me about you, tell him this. And so I'd like to get to know a little bit about someone. And then I hear the story that it's going to be something I'm going to tell him. So I told him, I met a kid the other day and he had kind of like, he had his golf shoes on and he was at Starbucks. I mean, we've been doing social distancing, but Starbucks is open. And so, of course, I have this story. And he had golf shoes on and I said to him, I said, hey, are you, did you play golf today? And he goes, he says, uh, I'm heading there. And I go, wow. I said, I'm thinking like you and me, Jay. I mean, we should, you play nine. I haven't played. I, I want to go out. And so I said, so are you a good golfer? I said, so we started talking a little bit. And I said, I said uh, who's your favorite oldest, greatest player that you loved? Arnold Palmer. I said, I, I, of course you, that's so good. I said, I played with Arnold Palmer. He goes, really? And I said, when we finished the round, it was, I got a chance to play with my dad. I said, when we finished the round, um, he was, he was so great. I said, he's like ordering a, a drink and he, or he gets to order an Arnold Palmer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking I got to have a Bob Bodine, but they might bring, <laughs> they might bring me mud. But, but so he tells me that, so you got to hear this. So I tell this guy, I said, so I said, uh, Arnold Palmer starts telling me a story. And he says, uh, he developed a golf course in Saudi Arabia. And I said, really? Wow, that's fantastic. And I said, uh, 
And he said, the king loved the course so much that we, as we did the celebratory round, at the end of the round, he says, I need to give you a gift. That's what he tells Arnold Palmer. And, and, and so Arnold Palmer goes, hey, I don't come to Saudi Arabia very often, and I charge you a lot of money you don't need. And he goes, no, I want to give you a gift. And Arnie goes, no, yes, no, yes, until the king says, I'm the king. If I tell you I'm going to give you a gift, you're taking my gift. And so Arnie looks at me and goes, Bob, I blew the protocol. And I'm thinking, hey, this is guy. And he, so he, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the king goes, what do you want? What, what do you say to a, to a king? So he says, I'm thinking, seriously. And so he says, I collect golf clubs. And so he's flying home and he's thinking, this is the richest man in the world. This is a true story. And so I'm telling this kid, the kid's like digging on it. It's like Arnold Palmer, holy cow. And, and I said, the, the king's so excited. I mean, the, Arnie's so excited that he's thinking, he, he's going to get me an all gold driver. It's going to be gemmed with rubies and diamonds and emeralds. 10 days go by at Bay Hill. He says, I don't get anything. 14 days, nothing. On the 15th day, I get a letter from the king. I'm totally bummed. And he says, and so he, he says, I open up the letter. And it's a deeded trust for 495 acres of a golf club. He, he bought him an entire golf club. Oh my God. Kings, kings think differently than you and I. They oh think my God. club and we think golf club. Yeah. And I said to this kid, I look at this kid and I said, so Arnie then looks at me and says, so what, so what are you thinking about your dream? And I go, what do you mean? And he said, I said, he said, as a man thinketh, as a woman thinketh, so are you. And he says, so Bob, he said, are you thinking golf club or golf club? And so I look at this kid and I go, so what are you thinking? And then the kid tells me about a problem that he's had. See, stories open up opportunities. And me being outrageous with a story opened up something where he then told me of some scar and he wanted to know if he could get by it. And I told him he could. And then I said, to him, I said, walk out with me after I said, let me buy you this cup of coffee and then walk out with me. And I'm going to give you a copy of a book, two chairs. And I'm going to show you that you got to lay that down. I said, and then you're going to start thinking golf club again. It's going to start being big. And I said, I said, you're going to hit the ball a lot better today just because you're going to be a little more peaceful, a little business. There's nothing about worry and stress that is healthy for our bodies right now. But the joy of the Lord is your strength. We got to be cheerful and joyful. How would God know at two chairs whether you believe him that he's taking care of everything? Well, as I see it, you'd be cheerful. <laughs> let's see some joy and that is of course the thing that we like about tom brady and games is like the last minute and a half he comes out and he's never been yelling at his offensive line because they didn't stop him and he got sacked he knows that a minute and 40 i'm gonna beat you right he's gonna, right. Do, it at, he's gonna do it at tampa bay too yeah <laughs> <laughs> wow that's amazing that's amazing you got you got his uh got his tight end back too so yeah it's a good thing. Good thing. Okay. Hey, so uh, I tell you, I, I really enjoy getting to know you better. I mean, I know you really well, and I really enjoy getting to know you better today. And, and I think the, the things that I admire the most is just, I mean, your, your courage. I mean, your courage to tell people about God and about your life and your struggles and your, I mean, nobody's perfect and, you know, and how to help people. No telling no telling how many people you've helped, you know, not, not only in your books that you've written, which I, I highly recommend. I read both of them, but I, I'd also, you know, of, of people on, on, on this podcast or, or your show or your, you know, if, if you need bobbodine.com and go on his LinkedIn, join him on LinkedIn because he sends out a great message one or two times a week. I don't know if it's once a week or twice. But I do it every day. Every day. Okay. Well, I mean, I know there's a lot. Yeah, I'm not a social media and Facebook, owner. and I do it Facebook for people. Yeah. So I, you know, people need to be inspired. They do, they do, and, and you never know when it's just that one little message that just you know helps them get through the day instead of them going right or left. I mean, it, it's just a great, great message. But but uh, I I do admire not only a family man with Cheryl and your three daughters and uh, just a great, great guy that I really admire. And uh, love to play golf with you really soon while the weather, before the weather gets as they are in here. Are you playing golf yet? I know you, yeah. you had a 
Yeah, I, I got a, my left shoulder's a little bit, but the answer is yes. Okay, good, good, good. So, no, I we want to do that. I thought about Ryan Binkley. Yeah. And uh, I thought about Ryan Binkley, so I need to get with Ryan and we need to play and oh, yeah. put this thing together, which I'd love to do. Yeah, I'd love to do that too. And it's but been an honor to be with you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's been an honor because you're so – it's so easy to talk with somebody about things that matter because they matter to you. And so right. that makes me feel more inclined to do that than it is that all of a sudden they we're doing something formal, right? And so right. I, I really appreciate you for that. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And i tell you what, the, the, the second – I got Terry I the second time I heard the prison story. I mean, that, it's just amazing – and, and the way that you inspired all those people and, and, and I don't, I, I know that you're following up with them and you're making sure that you're in their life in front, in front of them and all that, which is, which is amazing. And, and those people I'm sure have given up, yeah. you, you know, just, just giving up hope and, and what you put in their minds and their brains and their hearts that, that are just help them, help them throughout their life, which is, which is, uh, you know, very, very inspirational. Cause I mean, I meet somebody like you and I talk to somebody like you, I, I just get inspired. I mean, it's just very, very easy to get inspired and talk, talk to people. And, and, uh, I'm gonna go to Starbucks and we'll see if I can find somebody. <laughs> but you know what? I'm, I can't say, I mean, I, I wrote a book, you know, <laughs> upside of oil and gas investing. They're not going to care about that. They're going to say, I'm going to say, Hey, have you ever heard of Bob Bodine? <laughs> you, know, you ever heard of Bob Bodine and, uh, and two chairs. I mean, that's what, that's what we'll need to talk about. And most of the time I've done that my whole life is that everything, everything good that's been written is already, you know, somebody else wrote, God wrote that all beforehand. So we're all like, we're all using his good stuff anyway. <laughs> that's great. Well, I'll tell you what, Bob, thank you very much for coming on today. Thank you. And God bless you and Cheryl and, and, and everybody. And I'll tell you what, it's just been, it's been so good. And, uh, you know, getting through these times right now with the pandemic and the unprecedented times and everything, it's just so inspirational to, Here's somebody like you, but go to BobBodine.com, buy his book, Two Chairs, The Power of Who, go to Create Church, him and Mr. Minkley. I mean, it's just a, it's great to be around people like you because, you know, we are who we hang around and, and who we surround ourselves with. I, I know we didn't get involved in that real deep, which we can do anytime. Love to have you back on sometime, but, but I'll tell you what, it's just been very inspirational. Thank you so much, Bob, for being on. Blessings to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks,